Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we're kicking off our read-through of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Today, we'll be talking about the prologue. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that Comrade and I know that this fantasy series is the best story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. No critique on the series. Just pure love, baby. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. I did have to beat myself last week. <laughs> did you? I did. <laughs> Wait, it was, just, it was the greatest of. <laughs> so <laughs> Somehow some future name came up and I had to beep it. Oh, okay. I am kind of surprised I didn't do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. How did you spoil something when we were literally covering the entire book? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and it's not recommended for children. Our show's listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you, so send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. I can't believe I said got. Do you want to redo that? No. Leave it in it. At least leave it in all of its ugliness. Just don't let my mother find out about this. <laughs> all right. The prologue of Memories of Ice. The book begins with a passage. Quote, The ancient wars of the Talan Imas and the Jagut saw the world torn asunder. Vast armies contended on the ravaged lands. The dead piled high. Their bone the bones of hills. Their spilled blood the blood of seas. Sorceries raged until the sky itself was fire. End quote. And this was from Ancient Histories, Volume 1, nice. by Kinnichik Carbarn. <laughs> I'm sorry, the name is Carbarn. It's just straight up Carbarn. Okay. Let me ask you something. <laughs> These ancient histories that have multiple volumes, do they have salesmen mm. going around selling <laughs> Volume 1 through 10 of the ancient histories oh, so you could have it on your bookshelf? I, I wonder if my parents still have that encyclopedia set. Good gracious i want that thing so badly which one did you have it wasn't britannica it was um, compton's i'm not sure what the call it was a two all i know is my parents had this two-tone it was black and white actually or cream okay maybe green and cream kind of deal it was pretty cool i pulled it out here and there to check it out and i did use it for my term papers <laughs> okay i'm sorry they actually wrote my term papers for me uh, <laughs> God, okay. <laughs> Are you admitting to some type of plagiaristic behavior, Billy? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. I believe that the statute of limitations is probably well passed. <laughs> it's been about 37 years now, so I would think that's probably pretty gone. It was a local small high school's English class. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. The idea that vast armies were on both sides of this conflict is a new idea to me. So far, I thought it was large numbers of Talan Imas hunting family-sized units of Jag. That's kind of what I was thinking of, too. But, dude, does the idea of armies of Jagut sound pretty frightening and horrific? It sounds epic. Dude. What would an army of Jagut <laughs> have to have to go against that would justify having an army of Jagut? You know, I don't even know because everything I refer to... Let me ask you something. In your mind, when you do referencing, who do you reference for your thoughts on monsters? Do you like? Are you thinking of like old Tolkien stuff? I'm thinking like, is a Jagut like a a Balrog or stronger? Or are they? Are, you know, what are they? I mean, okay, it's probably the Warcraft universe is what prominently comes to my mind okay. because I was just so invested in it over the years i played warcraft one two and three and then wow okay. so it's a very similar okay. structure the magic's perhaps a little bit more simplistic but it has escalations of power levels and stuff like that so that's kind of my basis of it okay i don't even know Comron. this is just this is a mind-blowing thought i still carry it in my head around the fast army is a human place we got that because we we do that from time to time here <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah the malazan military is very big yeah, so the idea of a bunch of these fellas getting out, you know, several million of them, you know, I, that's, that's not a problem to envision. But the idea of several million Jagut is kind of kind of really scary, man. Yeah. Because I'm assuming that it takes, I don't know, what do they like equal? Does it take 20? Is, 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 it, is it Jagut equal to one human, 20 humans, 50 humans? Is it like one? You know, no, man, I mean, it's way more. I would have to say it's way more than that. To a thousand, isn't it? Like one. 
like a thousand to one. It's massively asymmetrical. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. I guess it depends on if all Jagoot have access to Omtos Falak, which I assumed they did. That's what I'm thinking. I, I assume they're all magic users, every one of them. Right, and if that's the case and they can raise masses of ice willy-nilly. Yeah. I just don't see how... Yeah, I, I don't really have a number to it. I mean, obviously, yeah. the Talani mass, as we'll find out later here, they were hunting them before they even took the vow. So yeah. there's some number that would be the right answer for what you're saying. I yeah. just don't know what that is. I don't know what it is either, but it's a fascinating thought, though. Yeah. The prologue begins in Myth Key M, also known as the Pogrom of the Rotted Flower. The 33rd Jagut War, 298,665 years before Burns' sleep. Wow. Do you remember what number we were on? It mentions the number of Jagut Wars in gardens, and we're like in the 60s weren't we? It was like a quick jump because he goes, wait a minute, the last time we talked to you fellas, you know, before y'all disappeared on us, it was like there was only like two more, there was like, they had fought two more wars since then. There was a mention of the sixth Jagut War. And then later, Tool mentions that he was the only survivor of the 28th Jagut War. Huh. When they, okay. they went after them in seven cities. So the 28th predates 298,000 years ago? Yes. Wow. Because the way that I felt about that was almost like, well, we knew about all these other ones, except for this sounded like a new number that we didn't know about almost the way that I read that at the time, I think. But wow. So, the, so Tool's been basically alone, shorn for 300,000 years. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is Lorne says, I thought those wars numbered 27. Yeah. So maybe this is one of those situations where... We're starting to see some inconsistencies. Yeah, a little bit of an inconsistency. Okay. I was just curious because that's one that kind of, I, those weird numbers, I love, I don't know why, but I love it when, I guess it's because I'm obsessive compulsive and the numbers are what tweak me out in this series in particular because it's such vast numbers of years. And I'm like, wow, the 33rd war was, you know, that's 300,000 years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. That's, maybe yeah. that was the number of wars after they took the vow. Maybe they restarted the count or oh, something. Maybe so. Reset. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what had once been the inland freshwater sea, the IMAS called Jagra Till, born from the shattering of the Jagut ice fields, was now in its own death throes. Dwindling pools and stretches of knee deep water were visible for as far south as the eye could scan. But nonetheless, newly birthed land dominated the vista. The breaking of the sorcery that had raised the glacial age returned to the region the old natural seasons, but the memories of mountain-high ice lingered. The exposed bedrock to the north was gouged and scraped, its basins filled with boulders. The heavy silts that had been the floor of the inland sea still bubbled with escaping gases. Jagratil's life had been short, yet the silts that had settled on its bottom were thick and treacherous. Pran Cole, bonecaster of Kanig Toll's clan among the Kron I Mass, sat motionless atop a mostly buried boulder along an ancient beach ridge. Twelve paces beyond, the land dropped slightly, then stretched out into a broad basin of mud. Three Ranag had become trapped in a boggy sinkhole twenty paces into the basin. A bull male, his mate, and their calf, ranged in a pathetic defensive circle. Mired and vulnerable, they must have seemed easy kills for the pack of A that found them. But the land was treacherous indeed. The large tundra wolves had succumbed to the same fate as the Ranag. Pran Cole counted six A, including a yearling. Tracks indicated that another yearling had circled the sinkhole dozens of times before wandering westward, doomed no doubt to die in solitude. How long ago had this drama occurred? There was no way to tell. The mud had hardened on Ranag and A alike, forming cloaks of clay latticed with cracks. Spots of bright green showed where windborne seeds had germinated, and the bone caster was reminded of his visions when spirit walking. For the beasts, the struggle had become eternal, hunter and hunted locked together for all time. I had some notes here. Pran Cole is known to us. He is the bone caster that was present for the ritual where Tattersail's soul was shifted from the burned husk into the baby in the Reavy woman's belly in Gardens of the Moon. As far as Ranag go, I picture them as something vaguely caribou-like. What do they look like to you? That's kind of what I'm going with as well. I don't know if that'd be more primal, like, I don't know if that means smaller or bigger. But yeah, something in that kind of, in that vein. I almost assume everything was bigger. Yeah, that's me. 
I mean, it's, it's like the caribou. It was big caribou, <laughs> like moose. Yeah. Well, they're they're pretty they're almost as big as a moose, anyhow. But I mean, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, real big. Mm-hmm. And then the A, it said they're tundra wolves. Yeah, the old dire wolves. Like we have like those little skeletons of these dire wolves, big old boys. Mm-hmm. You know something. Well, a wolf. I'll tell you a quick, a quick aside here. My brother and his friend, his late friend, used to go hunting. They spend a month up in the Upper Peninsula there in uh, what is that? Michigan has an Upper Peninsula. I forget. Anyhow, they go hunting woodcock, and they saw these. One time they were out hunting and uh, saw some. He thinks he saw a wolf, and my brother said, "Why we think it was a wolf is because this grass was up to my hips or almost my hip." And my brother's six two, and he says this belly of this dog <laughs> was clearing the grass. Oh my God. So because it had to be a wolf. So if that's a wolf. Then imagine how big a dire wolf I'm assuming is, a, you know, is another couple of foot bigger and more girthy and probably several, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds heavier. Yeah. <laughs> if not a hundred, you know, so they're big animals. I've seen some clips of them running on the roads in Alaska and they're going mm. like 40 miles an hour. Yeah. No problem. And yeah. they look like they're sticking up to the height of the window of the car and you're just, yeah yeah <laughs> that's not cool scary yeah that's not good i don't know what's scarier that or the fact that a wolverine will follow you for a while or it follows prey for days hiding up in trees following them those guys are they apparently make the honey badger their cousins look pretty tame from what i understand with the wolverine <laughs> Yeah. And the honey badgers are considered nature's crackheads. They got that little man complex. <laughs> the wolverines have the size to back it up. They do. But the, <laughs> what's funny, the, the honey badgers got that attitude. But uh-huh. it's like, and they sure try to and sometimes back it up pretty well. I remember seeing this guy. He rescued a young wolverine. Is it, st- oh, is it wolverine or is it the, the wolverine? The okay. Okay. He kept it in a cabin with him, but they were in a remote location. And this thing was manic all over the place all the time. And they had to be outdoors doing some activity most of the time to get that energy out. It's not an animal that you can keep as a pet, really. The only reason he had it was because he had to nurse it from when it was young. And yeah. I want to say he lived in Alaska. It's not something that you would want to do. Yeah, because if you get bit by them, they're real bad, too. Their teeth are turned funny, apparently. Mm. (laughs) They kind of gore you pretty bad when they bite up on you. (laughs) Amazing creatures. Yes. The imagery of the hunters and the hunted all frozen here with the plants growing on them in patches is interesting. Probably some life lesson there. Yeah, maybe so. I'm guessing these people are victims of when the Jagut raised the glacier to begin with, though. I don't think so. I think that they got trapped in the clay. I look at it kind of like the tar pits that they have in California and other places. Okay. where things get stuck in them then the hunters yes. see their prey stuck in them like oh i'm gonna go out there and they also get it. stuck you yeah know? that's true okay probably something about greed Yo, yeah right <laughs> someone padded to pran cole's side and crouched down beside him his tawny eyes remained fixed on the frozen tableau the rhythm of footsteps told him the identity of his companion and now came the warm-blooded smells that were as much a signature as resting eyes upon the man's face Kanig toll spoke what lies beneath the clay, Bonecaster? Pran Cole said, Only that which has shaped the clay itself, clan leader. Kenig Toll asked, You see no omen in these beasts? Pran Cole smiled and asked, Do you? Kenig Toll considered for a time, then said, Ranag are gone from these lands. So too the A. We see before us an ancient battle. These statements have depth, for they stir my soul. Pran Cole said, Mine as well. So to your point a second ago, they're talking about how these were, they're gone from these lands and so are the A, and it's an ancient battle. Yeah. So I guess maybe they were frozen in the ice. I, that's what I, that's the only reason. I, I guess that's why I was thinking that they may have been frozen. Like maybe they got stuck in the mud pits at one point. So like you said, they were stuck here in the mud. That's what my assumption would be. And then they may have been frozen. But I'm assuming they were all dead when they were frozen though. And I guess, I don't know. But if they still have flesh on their bones and stuff like that, then they would have to be frozen. Uh, they don't. They're, I think they're encased in this clay that are hardened. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. So I don't really know. Yeah, because the it, way I visualized it was the ice left, and then there's all these silts from that sea that used to be here. Right. And the animals came and got trapped in it. Yeah. In terms of the time between the two, I, did they say it was eight years since the glacier yes. had 
Yeah, okay, so they, maybe it was sometime in the last couple of years they got trapped here. Yeah, yeah, could be. Yeah, but he calls well, it an I, ancient I, I, battle. <laughs> so that makes me yeah. think it was they've been there, or maybe they, it's for them to become encased okay. in whatever. So I got no idea. Who knows? All right. Yeah, I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> Kenneg Toll said, We hunted the ran egg until they were no more. And this brought starvation to the A, for we had also hunted the ten egg until there were no more as well. The Ag Corps who walk with the veteran would not share with the A, and now the tundra is empty. From this, I conclude that we were wasteful and thoughtless in our hunting. At least they recognized the error of their ways. Yeah, a little too late, but yeah. <laughs> Any ideas what the Tenag and Ag Corps are? The Tenag, I'd put maybe at like a deer type, antelope type of game that these people probably hunted and subsisted off as well, and the Ag Corps who walk with the veteran not share with the maybe some type of other dog or wolf maybe they just kind of mm. hung out with the badaran like a herding animal maybe hmm. but i don't know why they would hang out with them unless there was humans involved with it true and it doesn't sound like you know it so i would be more inclined to think that they're all some kind of deer type antelope type thing except for the ag core because the way it says won't share with the a I, I got no idea maybe they're goats maybe they're aggressive rams or something like maybe like that. some type of cat that could be too better and i always viewed as musk ox like big hairy uh, herbivores the, yeah buffaloes for me okay They're, i think it's that world's buffalo equivalent american bison yeah okay yeah i'm thinking the american bison pran cole said yet the need to feed our own young kenneth toll said the need for more young was great pran cole said it remains so clan leader kenneth toll grunted the Jagoot were powerful in these lands, Bonecaster. They did not flee, not at first. You know the cost in Imass blood. Prankol said, and the land yields its bounty to answer that cost. Kanigtol said, to serve our war. Prankol said, thus the depths are stirred. The clan leader nodded and was silent. Prankol waited as Kanigtol pondered the scene. After a moment, the clan leader said, we are as those beasts. Prankol's eyes shifted to the south horizon tightened. Kanig Toll continued, We are the clay, and our endless war against the Jagoot is the struggling beast beneath. The surface is shaped by what lies beneath. He gestured with one hand and went on, and before us now, in these creatures slowly turning to stone, is the curse of eternity. There was still more. Pran Cole said nothing. Kanig Toll continued, Ranag and A, almost gone from the mortal realm, hunter and hunted both. Pran Cole whispered to the very bones. Kenig Toll rose and muttered, Would that you had seen an omen. Prankol also straightened and said, Would that I had, in a tone that only faintly echoed Kenig Toll's wry, sardonic utterance. Kenig Toll asked, Are we close, Bonecaster? Prankol glanced down at his shadow, studied his silhouette. He said, Tomorrow. They are weakening. A night of travel will weaken them yet more. Kenig Toll said, Good. Then the clan shall camp here tonight. Prankol listened as Kanig Toll made his way back down to where the others waited. With darkness, Prankol would spirit walk into the whispering earth, seeking those of his own kind. While their quarry was weakening, Kanig Toll's clan was yet weaker. Less than a dozen adults remained. When pursuing Jagoot, the distinction of hunter and hunted had little meaning. Less than 12 adults? And they still continue the hunt? That's pretty crazy. Dude, that speaks a lot about the ability of the eye mass. I mean, because I'm me and you were thinking of the Jagoot and their orders of magnitude strength over humans, but you know, these twelve eye mass, less than twelve adults. Oh well, there could be more than there could be twelve adults. There could be a hundred children. So I, I don't know, but that's still kind of amazing, though. I thought they needed more to subdue the Jagoot. That's what I would have thought too. He lifted his head and sniffed the crepuscular air. <laughs> Another bone caster wandered this land. The taint was unmistakable. He wondered who it was, wondered why it traveled alone, bereft of clan and kin, and knowing that even as he had sensed its presence, so it in turn had sensed his. He wondered why it had not yet sought them out. He said the word. <laughs> First crepuscular sighting. <laughs> yes. I thought of you immediately when I, <laughs> I read this. I like, yes, yes. I have not seen ochre yet. <laughs> it's coming <laughs> when we're dealing with the imas and the jagoot it's kind of it's almost it's inevitable 
Okay, we'll see. Because shades of ochre always seem to accompany the eye mask. That'd be funny if we started tracking how far into each book these words appeared. Oh, my word. <laughs> That's too funny. I love that idea, but it's oh my word. This is this is one of our favorite words, crepuscular. And especially since we like cats and they're crepuscular animals. <laughs> I was watching a documentary and the lady referred to them as such and I started dying laughing. The Archer brings it up uh, several times when they're talking about the was it Cheryl's got that um she's got something. She's got some kind of animal that sprays a lot. It's in the cat clan, I think. It was a serval, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> <laughs> but he's but he always talks about it's crepuscular it's crepuscular it's like, and he shouts it like because it's just a fact it's like it's it, it's it's because of archer that i learned the terms wait that, was it an ocelot ocelot thank you it's an ocelot <laughs> and he's crepuscular and it's crepuscular it's like it, it, yes it is but it's like it's always brought up when it's said you're like it, yes <laughs> and <laughs> and but it's kind of it's where i learned about diegetic and non-diegetic music was from archer do you know what that is <laughs> have i talked about diegetic with you we have talked about I this in a past had. episode okay. i think that might have been in excruciating detail this is a while yeah, ago oh yeah okay either you use real music or not music any music added to a scene you know like via editing and stuff not is considered diegetic if it's stuff coming from like a radio in the movie, that's non-diegetic. Okay, gotcha. So it's an odd thing to use because everything has diegetic music, except for the movie The Birds. There's no music in the movie The Birds. I just we watched that recently, and I, it was the first time I actually realized this. Mm -hmm. Any music you hear is coming from people driving by in cars, nice, or on the radio. It's weird when you watch it. You're like, oh, that makes it more real. And then I just watched a horror movie where they did the same thing in a violent nature, but it follows you. It's a slasher movie that follows it from the killer, the undead killer who follows people around killing them. It follows it from his viewpoint. <laughs> in The Dark Knight Rises, when Batman is fighting Bane mm -hmm. the first time, there was no music. There's no music. All you hear is the sounds of the water and the fight, the fight their dialogue and it took the tension up to the next level it was it great it can be amazing we are taken somewhere else <laughs> she pulled herself clear of the mud and dropped down onto the sandy bank her breath coming in harsh labored gasps her son and daughter squirmed free of her leaden arms crawled further onto the island's modest hump the jagoot mother lowered her head until her brow rested against the cool damp sand grit pressed into the skin of her forehead the burns were too recent to have healed, nor were they likely to. She was defeated, and death had only to await the arrival of her hunters. They were mercifully competent, at least. These eye masks cared nothing for torture. A swift killing blow, for her, then for her children. And with them, with this meager, tattered family, the last of the Jagut would vanish from this continent. Mercy arrived in many guises. Had they not joined in chaining race, they would all, eye masks and Jagut both, have found themselves kneeling before that tyrant. A temporary truce of expedience. She'd known enough to flee once the chaining was done. She'd known, even then, that the Imas clan would resume the pursuit. Race was such a threat that they had to join forces to subdue him? Must have been quite a threat if they're willing to put that aside. Yeah, and this is crazy because it goes back to our earlier talk about wars involving large numbers of the Jagoot. Because the Jagoot, to me, sound like a race of hulks on the magic user equivalent like we were discussing. And then this thick of race, he's so souped up that it requires like all of them, along with all of the IMAS, to put this fellow down. We're not even sure if we got rid of him. We know we haven't because we've seen him show up in gardens. So that's not, you know, but he was bound for several hundred thousand years. But it's like, man. What do you mean by you look at them as hulks from a magic perspective? Well, just like Hulk to me is kind of like in the Marvel Universe, one of the most strongest critters on the planet. You know, if not the, you know, if not the uh, maybe the solar system. Imagine just a race of these people that are all super powerful because they're all super powerful magic users, at least from my understanding. But race, I mean, how much more powerful is he that he has to be so much powerful that they all want to gang up to beat him? And he's not the only one. Other tyrants are mentioned, not by name, but the fact that there's been more than one of these Jagoot tyrants. Yeah. So they've risen up in the past and it's such a bad deal. Everyone would rather, it's almost like the Jagoot would be happy to die as opposed to being enslaved. And I, and I get that. <laughs> Agreed. The mother felt no bitterness, but that made her no less desperate. 
Sensing a new presence on the small island, her head snapped up. Her children had frozen in place, staring up in terror at the Imas woman who now stood before them. The mother's gray eyes narrowed. She said, Clever, Bonecaster. My senses were turned only to those behind us. Very well, be done with it. The young, black-haired woman smiled. She said, No bargains, Jagoot? You always seek bargains to spare the lives of your children. Have you broken the kin threads with these two then? They seem young for that. The Jagoot mother said, Bargains are pointless. Your kind never agree to them. The Imas said, No, yet still your kind try. The Jagoot mother said, I shall not. Kill us then, swiftly. She must be so exhausted if she's not even going to try and use her warren. I'm guessing she probably can't. She can't even defend herself. That's how exhausted she must be. Mm. So from a gaming perspective, it's almost like she's used up all her spells and she just can't yeah. draw on her warren anymore. Yeah, it's just, man, I just I got nothing. <laughs> the eye mask was wearing the skin of a panther. Her eyes were as black and seemed to match its shimmer in the dying light. She looked well-fed, her large, swollen breasts indicating that she had recently birthed. The Jagoot mother could not read the woman's expression, only that it lacked the typical grim certainty she usually associated with the strange, rounded faces of the Imas. The Imas Bonecaster spoke, I have enough Jagoot blood on my hands. I leave you to the Kron clan that will find you tomorrow. The Jagoot mother growled, To me, it matters not which of you kills us, only that you kill us. I love that quote. It is. It's a good quote. <laughs> The IMS woman's broad mouth quirked. I can see your point. Weariness threatened to overwhelm the Jagoot mother, but she managed to pull herself into a sitting position. Between gasps, she asked, What do you want? The IMS woman said, To offer you a bargain. Breath catching, the Jagoot mother stared into the bone caster's dark eyes and saw nothing of mockery. Her gaze then dropped, for the briefest of moments, on her son and daughter, then back up to hold steady on the woman's own. The IMS slowly nodded. We step forward in time. The earth had cracked some time in the past. A wound of such depth as to birth a molten river wide enough to stretch from horizon to horizon. That's a big crack. That's a big crack. <laughs> That's not even a fault line. No, this is like a crevasse. I mean, it's, 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 it's a valley, but it's a sheer valley. <laughs> Filled with lava? Yeah. Vast and black, the river of stone and ash reached southwestward, down to the distant sea. Only the smallest of plants had managed to find purchase, and the Bonecaster's Passage, a Jagoot child in the crook of each arm, raised clouds of dust that hung motionless in her wake. That is a long time to carry two children like this. Yeah, it is. She judged the boy at perhaps five years of age, his sister perhaps four. Neither seemed entirely aware, and clearly neither had understood their mother when she'd hugged them goodbye. The long flight down the Laamath and across the Jagratil had driven them both into shock. No doubt witnessing the ghastly death of their father had not helped matters. Those poor kids, so much trauma to go through at such a young age. Oh, yeah. This is a traumatic world they live in, though. It's very brutal. <laughs> yes, it is. They clung to her with their small, grubby hands, grim reminders of the child she had but recently lost. Before long, both began suckling at her breasts, evincing desperate hunger. Sometime later, the children slept. The lava flow thinned as she approached the coast. A range of hills rose into distant mountains on her right. A level plain stretched directly before her, ending at a ridge half a league distant. Though she could not see it, she knew that just the other side of that ridge, the land slumped down to the sea. The plain itself was marked by regular humps, and the bonecaster paused to study them. The mounds were arrayed in concentric circles, and at the center was a larger dome, all covered in a mantle of lava and ash. The rotted tooth of a ruined tower rose from the plain's edge, at the base of the first line of hills. Those hills, as she had noted the first time she had visited this place, were themselves far too evenly spaced to be natural. The bonecaster lifted her head. The mingled scents were unmistakable, one ancient and dead, the other less so. The boy stirred in her clasp, but remained asleep. She murmured, ah, you sense it as well. Skirting the plain, she walked toward the blackened tower. The Warren's gate was just beyond the ragged edifice, suspended in the air at about six times her height. She saw it as a red welt, a thing damaged, but no longer bleeding. She could not recognize the Warren. The old damage obscured the portal's characteristics. Unease rippled faintly through her. And that sounds a lot like the rent they found in the nascent when they were aboard the Salanda, doesn't it? Yes, it does. 
do you think, because I kind of think it does, that in this universe, this probably happens more than you realize. All these folks punching holes through, you know, using powerful magics and these earth shattering energies being released. You know, I'm so, in all honesty, it's surprising no one has actually destroyed the entire planet at one time. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I guess the only consolation is there aren't that many mages around yeah. and hopefully there's enough people with knowledge to know not to go too far yeah well you know the, the great thing i say the great thing for the humans you know they're they can only go as far as their bodies will take them and that, that you know that leaves them you know kind of limited which is a good thing but these other ones are so powerful it, it blows me away because she describes it almost exactly like that written salon to like I'm assuming that it used to leak that chaotic energy that make you sick to look at it. Yes. The fact that it's making her uneasy. Yeah. Like it's scabbed. It's like, I feel like it's kind of slightly scabbed. Do you ever watch Stranger Things? Yeah. It's, you know, kind of that scabbed over portal down in the basement. I'm imagining like there's a hole there, but there's kind of like got a membrane over it right now because it's kind of healing up a little bit, you know, not quite, but it's, you know, maybe it's healing up a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's pulsing a little bit. Yes. Yeah. That's actually a good visual. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm seeing. So, <laughs> the bone caster set the children down by the tower, then sat on a block of tumbled masonry. Her gaze fell to the two young Jagoot, still curled in sleep, lying on their beds of ash. She whispered, "What choice? It must be Amtos Falak. It certainly isn't Talon. Starvald Demolane, unlikely." Quick reminder that Starvald Demolane is also known as the First Warren, the Warren of Tium and the Warren of Elaint slash dragons. We need the more you know. <laughs> Some type of chime? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not I just think it's always funny when they pull that out sometimes, the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> Her eyes were pulled to the plain, narrowing on the mound rings. She whispered, who dwelt here? Who else was in the habit of building in stone? She fell silent for a long moment, then swung her attention back to the ruin and said, This tower is the final proof, for it is not else but Jagoot, and such a structure would not be raised this close to an inimical warren. No, the gate is Amtos Falak. It must be so. Still, there were additional risks. An adult Jagoot in the warren beyond, coming upon two children not of its own blood, might as easily kill them as adopt them. She said, Then their deaths stain another's hands, a Jagoot's. Scant comfort that distinction. She thought back to what the Jagoot mother had said. It matters not which of you kills us, only that you kill us. The breath hissed between the bone caster's teeth. Again, she said, what choice? She would let the children sleep a little longer. Then she would send them through the gate. A word to the boy, take care of your sister. The journey will not be long. And to them both, your mother waits beyond. A lie, but they would need courage. If she cannot find you, then one of her kin will. Go then to safety, to salvation. After all, what could be worse than death? What a way to end a section. Yeah. There are most yeah. certainly things worse than death. Oh, oh in this world, most assuredly. Yes. It's, it's like, here's a great Black Adder line. It's like he says, they're, they're captured by the Red Baron. He says something to him about, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you cross me, you're going to suffer fate worse than death. And he says, and if you do this, you'll suffer even worse. He says, so a fate worse than a fate worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> the traditional German welcome. So it's like, you know, <laughs> and I always like, so I, th I can't, sometimes I always think about that. Yeah, there are fates worse than fates worse than death in this world, man. Oh boy. We go back to the Jagoot mother. She rose as they approached. Prankol tested the air, frowned. The Jagoot had not unveiled her warren. Even more disconcerting, where were her children? Kanigtol muttered, she greets us with calm. Prankol said, she does. Kanigtol said, I've no trust in that. We should kill her immediately. Prankol said, she would speak with us. Kanigtol said, a deadly risk to appease her desire. Prankol said, I cannot disagree, clan leader, yet. What has she done with her children? Kanigtol said, can you not sense them? Prankol shook his head and said, prepare your spearmen. He stepped forward. There was peace in her eyes, so clear in acceptance of her own imminent death that Prankol was shaken. He walked through shin-deep water, then stepped onto the island's sandy bank to stand face to face with the Jagoot. He demanded, What have you done with them? The mother smiled, lips peeling back to reveal her tusks. She said, Gone. Prankol asked, Where? The Jagoot mother said, Beyond your reach, Bonecaster. Prankol's frown deepened. He said, These are our lands. 
There is no place here that is beyond our reach. Have you slain them with your own hands then? The Jagut cocked her head, studied thy mass. She said, I had always believed you were united in your hatred of our kind. I had always believed that such concepts as compassion and mercy were alien to your natures. Prankul stared at the woman for a long moment. Then his gaze dropped away, past her, and scanned the soft clay ground. He said, Inimas has been here. A woman. The bone caster. He thought, the one I could not find in my spirit walk. The one who chose not to be found. He said, what has she done? The Jagut mother said, she has explored this land. She has found a gate far to the south. It is Amtos Falak. Prankol said, I am glad I am not a mother. He thought, and you woman should be glad I am not cruel. He gestured. Heavy spears flashed past him. Six long fluted heads of flint punched through the skin covering the Jagut's chest. She staggered, then folded to the ground in a clatter of shafts. Thus ended the 33rd Jagut War. Prankhol whirled and said, We've no time for a pyre. We must strike southward, quickly. Kanaktol stepped forward as his warriors went to retrieve their weapons. The clan leader's eyes narrowed on the bonecaster. He asked, What distresses you? Prankhol said, A renegade bonecaster has taken the children. Kanaktol asked, South? Prankhol said, To mourn. The clan leader's brows knitted. Prankhol went on, The renegade would save this woman's children. The renegade believes the rent to be Amtos Falak. Pran Cole watched the blood leave Kanig Toll's face. He whispered, Go to mourn, Bonecaster. We are not cruel. Go now. Pran Cole bowed. The Talon Warren engulfed him. This sounds really, really bad. That reaction that he has where the blood drains from his face. Mm. And agreed. The thing that gets, uh, that I find interesting about the Talon is that they are very pragmatic peoples and they are not cruel. You know, they may be pushed to war and very warlike, which is very interesting because of the fact that it's mentioned in Dead House how the Talan did that horrible maiming of those Jagut children in that area. Remember? Yes. They broke all their bones. Multiple times it sounded like on each limb. And it's like, so it has gone from this to where they don't seem very cruel. They just, let's just got to get the job done. It's like, we don't have really any, any animosity. Oh man, that is such a good point, dude. In 300,000 years, yeah. they lost this and we're going to break every bone in your body. Yeah. We're going to put a rock yeah. on top of you and then you're going to starve to death. However long that takes. Yeah. It's like, wow, they've become, <laughs> oh, geez. yeah, a lot more sadistic <laughs> over this time. <laughs> And then they also allegedly at the command of the emperor went into one of the cities in seven cities. I can't remember off the top of my head and killed everybody. Right. Was it Aaron? I think it was Aaron. Yeah. Because that's all the, everything went down at Aaron. Like the, like didn't uh, the death of the, uh, Tazimultor and all that stuff happened at Aaron. Mm, I thought that was outside Egatan. Egatan. Okay. I think you're right. I thought I'd have to review. We won't worry about it now, but, uh, but yeah, it's so much yeah, good gracious. It, uh, I just so love it. Mr. Erickson's world. It's so rich. <laughs> so I rich. Know. It's just so rich. You used it, to sit it, and talk about it all day. Dude, you could talk about it for two years straight, yeah. and you still have eight more years to talk about it, and it, it probably more after that. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest problem is the, the, the biggest problem that we have with the prologue episodes is this. Me and you are so excited about the new stuff introduced in the prologue, we spend forever going through a prologue. <laughs> Because I get so excited, like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. Yeah, we're on pace right now. Yeah, this is true. We're actually doing really good. I get very distracted because I get so excited by the new introduction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a really good prologue. Oh, I forgot how good this was. <laughs> the faintest release of her power sent the two Jagut children upward into the gate's maw. The girl cried out a moment before reaching it, a longing wail for her mother, who she imagined waited beyond. Then the two small figures vanished within. The bonecaster sighed and continued to stare upward, seeking any evidence that the passage had gone awry. It seemed, however, that no wounds had reopened, no gush of wild power bled from the portal. Did it look different? She could not be sure. This was new land for her. She had nothing of the bone-bred sensitivity that she had known all her life among the lands of the Tarad clan, in the heart of the First Empire. That would be the true First Empire, that of the Talani Mass, not the upstart human empire in Seven Cities that claimed the title afterwards. <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is like 300,000 years minimum before that. Well, not, not 300, but at least 100. Yeah, at least 100. Yeah. The Talon Warren opened behind her. 
The woman spun round, moments from veering into her soul taken form. An arctic fox bounded into view, slowed upon seeing her, then assembled back into its eye mass form. She saw before her a young man, wearing the skin of his totem animal across his shoulders, and a battered antler headdress. His expression was twisted with fear, his eyes not on her, but the portal beyond. The woman smiled. I greet you, fellow bonecaster. Yes, I have sent them through. They are beyond the reach of your vengeance, and this pleases me. His eyes fixed on her. He asked, Who are you? What clan? She said, I have left my clan, but I was once counted among the Logros. I am named Kilava. Prankol said, You should have let me find you last night. I would then have been able to convince you that a swift death was the greater mercy for those children than what you have done here, Kilava. Kilava said, They are young enough to be adopted. Prankol interrupted, You have come to the place called Morn, to the ruins of an ancient city. Kilava said, Jagut. Prankol said, Not Jagut. This tower, yes, but it was built long afterward. In the time between the city's destruction and the Tol Arad, this flow of lava which but buried something already dead. He raised a hand, pointed toward the suspended gate. He said, It was this, this wounding that destroyed the city, Kilava, the worn beyond. Do you not understand? It is not Amtos Falak. Tell me this, how are such wounds sealed? You know the answer, Bonecaster. We know the answer. Mm -hmm. Think back to the nascent and the Talan IMS allegedly sacrificing himself to steal the rent. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but yes. <laughs> but yeah, my good gracious. Yeah, it's not, it, it, it costs a lot to seal one of these. <laughs> In eternity of torment? Yes. Unless somebody volunteers to take your spot? Yes. Can you re-volunteer and take someone's spot? I think so, given the power. Okay. Yeah, if you have the ability to magically impose yourself into the rent, then I think you could put yourself in there. Okay. Because that's ultimately what that guy did, the Talani Mass, when he went up into the rent, he was going up there yes. himself. I mean, I don't think in the end he ended up there because he took that head of that Tistandee yeah. off the boat. And it takes more than humans, they said. It takes, you know, things that are... Yeah, you cool. have to some... What's the right word here? Uh, elder race? <laughs> No, no, I was going to say, this is probably not the right word, but some girth to your yeah. <laughs> spiritual ability, yeah. you know, like yeah. almost ascendant level it's, it's, to be able to have that. You're going to have to act as that tire plug. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I grew up working at a gas station, so I plugged a lot of tires in my life several hundred tires in my life so I'm like that's the best thing i got i plugged them too working yeah. at the car dealership there you go yep. yeah there you go i forgot to mention this earlier but morn is located on the southwest side of genabacus it's pretty far south though but it's on the western coast kilava slowly turned studied the rent she said if a soul sealed that wound then it should have been freed when the children arrived prankol hissed freed in exchange Trembling, Kilava faced him again. She said, then where is it? Why has it not appeared? Prankol turned to study the central mound on the plain. He whispered, oh, but it has. He glanced back at his fellow bonecaster and said, tell me, will you in turn give up your life for those children? They are trapped now in an eternal nightmare of pain. Does your compassion extend to sacrificing yourself in yet another exchange? He studied her, then sighed. I thought not. So wipe away those tears, Kilava. Hypocrisy ill suits a bone caster. And that's pretty messed up that she won't take responsibility for her mistake and take the children's spot sealing the rift. It's not a good start for Kilava from a morals perspective. I agree, but here's the other thing is like I guess I guess she's powerful enough to plug the hole because he's implying that here, but I didn't know if they would have been able to do that in their human form before the ritual. As a bone caster, I think she qualifies. I'm guessing by his previous statement that she does, yeah. Counterpoint to what I just said, possibly the case could be made that if she did replace them, they're just going to die anyway when they come back out. They'd kill them. So maybe yeah. she's like, well. He may have plans. That would guarantee the swift death, though, instead of an eternal torment of suffering. Yep, yeah, that's true. After some time, Kalava asked, what, what has been freed? Prankol shook his head. He studied the central mound again and said, I am not sure, but we shall have to do something about it sooner or later. I suspect we have plenty of time. The creature must now free itself of its tomb, and that has been thoroughly warded. More, there is the Tolarad's mantle of stone still clothing the barrow. After a moment, he added, but time we shall have. 
wonder what type of monstrosity has been unleashed. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're going to find out. You have to think it was somebody fairly powerful if they were put in there to seal that. Oh, this is crawly. Yeah. This... Amazing, amazing stuff. He just escalates. <laughs> Every book is an escalation. It's like, oh my gosh, how does he know? Oh, I think I mentioned some escalation in a second here. Oh yeah. my word, yes. Kilava asked, what do you mean? Prankol said, the gathering has been called. The ritual of Talon awaits us, Bonecaster. Mm. She spat, you are all insane to choose immortality for the sake of war. Madness. I shall defy the call, Bonecaster. He nodded and said, yet the ritual shall be done. I have spirit walked into the future, Kilava. I have seen my withered face of 200,000 and more years hence. We shall have our eternal war. Mm. Bitterness filled Kalava's voice as she said, my brother will be pleased. Prankol asked, who is your brother? Kalava said, Onos Tulan, the first sword. Mm. It's Tul's sister. Yes, sir. Prankol turned at this. He said, you are the defier. You slaughtered your clan, your kin. She said, to break the link and thus achieve freedom. Yes. Alas, my eldest brother's skills more than matched mine. Yet now we are both free. Though what I celebrate, Onos Tulan curses. She wrapped her arms around herself, and Prankol saw upon her layers and layers of pain. Hers was a freedom he did not envy. She spoke again. This city, then. Who built it? Prankol said, Kachain Shemal. Kilava said, I know the name, but little else of them. Prankol nodded. We shall, I expect, learn. Oh boy, a Kachain Shamal <laughs> burial mound with a soul stirring within. You got some good times ahead. <laughs> this cannot be good. No. <laughs> we go to another time and place. This portion of the prologue takes place on the continents of Corelri and Jakuruku in the time of dying, 119,736 years before Burns' sleep, three years after the fall of the crippled god. This is the first mention in the series of the crippled god. Mm, big mention. Don't forget. <laughs> From a geographical perspective, Jakuruku lies southwest of Kwantali. Korelri lies to the southeast of Kwantali. And they're about the same distance from Kwantali as Genabacus and Seven Cities. So it's, if you have Kwantali right in the middle, they're kind of in an X around it, okay. the four continents. The fall had shattered a continent. Forests had burned, the firestorms lighting the horizons in every direction, bathing crimson the heaving ash-filled clouds blanketing the sky. The conflagration had seemed unending, world-devouring, weeks into months, and through it all could be heard the screams of a god. Pain gave birth to rage, rage to poison, an infection sparing no one. This sounds like a combination of a meteor hitting the planet combined with some eldritch horror for the additional flavor on top of that living through months of a God screaming would be so nightmarish. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why this jumps into my brain. You ever seen the venture brothers? No. Oh my word. It is so stupid. It's really a, it's adult swim, but they have a version of the fantastic four and there's a human torch that is actually burning every time he's exposed to oxygen. So if he's ever on fire, he's screaming. <laughs> continuously and i can't stop laughing and but i'm imagining that for months and for some reason i can't stop laughing and i shouldn't be laughing <laughs> that would be horrific i bet uh, it'd be awful ah I just, I, it's over and over it's terrible <laughs> scattered survivors remained reduced to savagery wandering a landscape pocked with huge craters now filled with murky lifeless water the sky churning endlessly above them kinship had been dismembered Love had proved a burden too costly to carry. They ate what they could, often each other, and scanned the ravaged world around them with rapacious intent. One figure walked this landscape alone, wrapped in rotting rags. He was of average height, his features blunt and unprepossessing. There was a dark cast to his face, a heavy inflexibility in his eyes. He walked as if gathering suffering unto himself, unmindful of its vast weight, walked as if incapable of yielding, of denying the gifts of his own spirit. In the distance, ragged bands eyed the figure as he strode, step by step, across what was left of the continent that would one day be called Corelri. Hunger might have driven them closer, but there were no fools left among the survivors of the fall, and so they maintained a watchful distance, curiosity dulled by fear, for the man was an ancient god, and he walked among them. 
Beyond the suffering he absorbed, Cruel would have willingly embraced their broken souls, yet he had fed, was feeding, on the blood spilled onto this land. And the truth was this, the power born of that would be needed. In Cruel's wake, men and women killed men, killed women, killed children. Dark slaughter was the river the Elder God rode. Elder Gods embodied a host of harsh unpleasantries. And a quick reminder, the blood spilled in Cruel's belfry woke him up in Gardens of the Moon, and he fashioned the warren that was used in the Tattersail soul transfer ritual. The foreign god had been torn apart in his descent to earth. He had come down in pieces, in streaks of flame. His pain was fire, screams and thunder, a voice that had been heard by half the world, pain and outrage, and, Cruel reflected, grief. It would be a long time before the foreign god could begin to reclaim the remaining fragments of its life, and so begin to unveil its nature. Cruel feared that day's arrival. From such a shattering could only come madness. The summoners were dead, destroyed by what they had called down upon them. There was no point in hating them, no need to conjure up images of what they in truth deserved by way of punishment. They had, after all, been desperate. Desperate enough to part the fabric of chaos, to open a way into an alien, remote realm, to then lure a curious god of that realm closer, ever closer to the trap they had prepared. The summoners sought power, all to destroy one man. And what a setup! That is such an epic way to introduce him. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, man, this is... uh... This is amazing. <laughs> this is just absolutely amazing. We need a soundbite every time there's an escalation. It's like the signature escalation noise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be some kind of, because, uh, well, here's the bad thing about some of this. Sometimes the escalation is so subtle, though. Sometimes it's really in your face. <laughs> so it needs to be something like that. that can be scaled. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not talking about it needing to be scaled. I'm talking about the fact that sometimes I miss the points of escalation at the time until we get later into the escalation and go, oh, oh, that's where it started. So then you could have a retroactive escalation notification. There yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Make it so. All right. We'll have to think about that. A retro. <laughs> Well, so we need two kinds. We need the escalation sound plus the retroactive recognition escalation sound. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to think about that. Cruel had crossed the ruined continent, had looked upon the still living flesh of the fallen god, had seen the unearthly maggots that crawled forth from that rotting, endlessly pulsing meat and broken bone, had seen what those maggots flowered into. Even now, as he reached the battered shoreline of Jakuruku, the ancient sister continent to Corelri, they wheeled above him on their broad black wings. Sensing the power within him, they were hungry for its taste. And thus, the origin story for the great ravens is revealed. Spawning from maggots instead of eggs? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, nicely put. Yes, sir. It is interesting. Very interesting. It's weird you, because you would think that from maggots, flies would come. Yeah. Great ravens. Go figure. We already have huge dragonflies. Could have had huge flies. Yeah. <laughs> they already have enough hateful blood flies here on this world that we don't need any more to the flies here. Yeah. Because <laughs> imagine the size of a fly like that. That'd be horrific. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not right. <laughs> that's, that, for some reason, a lot of things scale well in my mind. You know? Great ravens, sure. Ant, absolutely. But I don't see giant. What I have stuck in my mind, you've played enough Fallout, are the bloat flies. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they're not big. They're big. But, you know, if they were big like Great Ravens, I'd think like Volkswagen Beetle sized, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. Flies. You, you know, they're big. I mean, Great Ravens are pretty big. Yeah, they are. They're like, I mean, they're big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's nasty. But a strong god could ignore the scavengers that trailed in his wake, and Cruel was a strong god. Temples had been raised in his name. Blood had for generations soaked countless altars in worship of him. The nascent cities were wreathed in the smoke of forges, pyres, the red glow of humanity's dawn. The first empire had risen on a continent half a world away from where Cruel now walked, an empire of humans born from the legacy of the Talani Mass, from whom it took its name. What a confusing mess. So that is the empire 
buried in the sands of seven cities then, I guess. Yes. And you're right. It's about 100,000 years later, the time between okay, these yeah. two. No, it's more than that. Yeah. It's like a, it was, it went to 119 from 298. So this is oh, like wow. 170, 170,000 yeah, years, roughly. Okay. That's a significant chunk of time. It's still quite ancient, but I mean, but not as ancient as the, as the Talan. Mm -hmm. But it had not been alone for long. It being the first empire, the second first empire. <laughs> yes. Here on Jakuruku, in the shadow of long dead Kachain Chamal ruins, another empire had emerged. Brutal, a devourer of souls. Its ruler was a warrior without equal. Cruel had come to destroy him, had come to snap the chains of 12 million slaves. Even the Jagut tyrants had not commanded such heartless mastery over their subjects. No, it took a mortal human to achieve this level of tyranny over his kin. Two other elder gods were converging on the Kalorian Empire. The decision had been made. The three, last of the elder, would bring to a close the High King's despotic rule. So the Jagut and Talani Mass joined forces to subdue Raced, and it takes elder gods to come together to deal with Kalor. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's spread all I got for that. Yeah. Also, this note that they are the last remaining elder gods, that's interesting because I think, what are we supposed to think of Mother Dark and Father Light? Did they come after these elder gods or are they more primal? Because of your question, what I, I, I was kind of, I, I think I have it phrased a little bit wrong here because I know that, let me just say what I have to think. I think they would have to come before, but not necessarily before Dark. But Elder, in my mind, are kind of probably the first, or would you say they are maybe like some of the first ascendants in that era of Mother Dark? But Cruel strikes me as very human, but we know Draconis. I'm sorry, am I jumping the gun on that one? This is the first We're time he's mentioned. We don't have any details about him. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, then, then I, I, I don't really know the Elder, this idea of Elder troubles me to some extent i understand the elder races mm -hmm. they've already spelled them out Don't, aren't they always spelled out in the initial and uh, the dramatis persona i mean doesn't it list the we know they could change them all and the test and the jagut are all El and the talan are they all elder it's, is that all the elders no you also have fork rule of sale oh thank you in the sale yeah but where i don't know where these folks fit i don't uh, this is where i become confused a lot of times because these other races are as long lived as everybody else. So it's like, who's, who's older? I'm assuming dark would be the oldest. I don't think we're going to get any answers to this until we read forge of darkness. Yes. Okay. I think you're right. So we have to wait till the third one is done. Then read through those. Yes. Cruel could sense his companions. Both were close. Both had been comrades once, but they all cruel included had changed, had drifted far apart. This would mark the first conjoining in millennia. He could sense a fourth presence as well, a savage, ancient beast following his spore, a beast of the earth, of winter's frozen breath, a beast with white fur bloodied, wounded almost unto death by the fall, a beast with but one surviving eye to look upon the destroyed land that had once been its home, long before the empire's rise, trailing but coming no closer, and cruel well knew it would remain a distant observer of all that was about to occur. The Elder God could spare it no sorrow, yet was not indifferent to its pain. He thought, we each survive as we must, and when time comes to die, we find our places of solitude. The Kalorian Empire had spread to every shoreline of Jakuruku, yet Cruel saw no one as he took his first steps inland. Lifeless wastes stretched on all sides. The air was gray with ash and dust, the skies overhead churning like lead in a smith's cauldron. The Elder God experienced the first breath of unease, sidling chill across his soul. Above him, the god spawned scavengers cackled as they wheeled. A familiar voice spoke in Cruel's mind. Brother, I am upon the north shore, Cruel said, and I the west. The voice asked, Are you troubled? Cruel said, I am. All is dead. The voice said, Incinerated. The heat remains deep beneath the beds of ash, ash and bone. A third voice spoke, Brothers, I am come from the south, where once dwelt the cities, all destroyed. The echoes of a continent's death cry still linger. Are we deceived? Is this illusion? Cruel addressed the first elder who had spoken in his mind. Draconis, I too feel the death cry. 
such pain, indeed, more dreadful in its aspect than that of the fallen one. If not a deception, as our sister suggests, what has he done? Draconis said, we have stepped onto this land, and so all share what you sense. Cruel, I too am not certain of its truth. Sister, do you approach the High King's abode? The third voice replied, I do, Brother Draconis. Would you and Brother Cruel join me now, that we may confront this mortal as one? We shall. Warrens opened, one to the far north, the other directly before Cruel. The two elder gods joined their sister upon a ragged hilltop where wind swirled through the ashes, spinning funereal wreaths skyward. Directly before them, on a heap of burnt bones, was a throne. Man, the imagery here. It's straight out of an 80s metal music video. It's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, just think about that. Man, just thinking about what was unleashed here. From what I'm understanding, what they're saying is that it's bad enough that the fall was bad enough, but the fall was not nearly as bad as what has been done here. Is that what they're saying? Yeah, that's what they're saying. Wow. The man seated upon it was smiling. After a moment of scornful regard, he rasped, as you can see, I have prepared for your arrival. Oh yes, I knew you were coming. Draconis of Tiam's kin, cruel opener of the paths. His gray eyes swung to the third elder. And you, my dear, I was under the impression that you had abandoned your old self, walking among the mortals, playing role of middling sorceress, such a deadly risk, though perhaps this is what entices you so to the mortal game. You stood on fields of battle, woman, one stray arrow, he slowly shook his head. Cruel said, We have come to end your reign of terror. Kalor's brows rose. He said, You would take from me all that I have worked so hard to achieve? Fifty years, dear rivals. Conquer an entire continent. Oh, perhaps Ardatha still held out. Always late in sending me my rightful tribute. But I ignored such petty gestures. She has fled. Did you know? The bitch. Do you imagine yourselves the first to challenge me? The circle brought down a foreign god. I, the effort went awry, thus sparing me the task of killing the fools with my own hand. And the fallen one? Well, he'll not recover for some time. And even then, do you truly imagine he will accede to anyone's bidding? I would have, Draconis growled, enough! Your prattling grows wearisome, Kalor. Kalor certainly sounds like he enjoys the sound of his own voice. A typical Bond villain. Dude, he could have kept going. <laughs> I feel like he had a lot more in him right there. <laughs> I think he was just starting to go. You know, he was like, he had, he, he would have been going for a couple of hours. You know, he was going to deliver a sermon on this, I feel. He had something to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was going to talk from the mat. You know what? Cowler's got that Manson vibe going sometimes, doesn't he? It's like, <laughs> Oh, he's man. like, a, and he's, he's got that. I'll talk it from the mountains. You know, I'm, if, 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 I'm going to move on it. You're going to, I'm going to move on it. You know, it's like, <laughs> When I say do it, it gets done. And if it don't get done, I'll move on it. I'll move on. That's what it is. Oh, my gosh. That is so funny. That's Calor, though. But Calor's for real. Yeah. Calor leaned forward and sighed, very well. You've come to liberate my people from my tyrannical rule. Alas, I am not one to relinquish such things. Not to you, not to anyone. He settled back, waved a languid hand. He said, thus, what you would refuse me, I now refuse you. Though the truth was before Cruel's eyes, he could not believe it. He said, what have? Kalor clutched the arms of the throne and shrieked, are you blind? It is gone. They are gone. Break the chains, will you? Go ahead. No, I surrender them. Here, all about you is now free. Dust, bones, all free. The sister elder whispered, you have in truth incinerated an entire continent? Jakuruku, Kalor said, is no more and never again shall be. What I have unleashed will never heal. Do you understand me? Never. And it is all your fault. Yours. Paid in bone and ash. This noble road you chose to walk. Your road. Man, he really exercised the nuclear option, didn't he? Yeah, Keller don't play. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't play. Oh, you want to take your basketball? No, I'm going to burn it. <laughs> it's like, I'll burn the, I'll I'll burn burn the, the court. court and the arena. Yeah. <laughs> Your parents' house, everyone that built the court, I'll kill them all. You know, it's like... The country the court was built in. Oh, my God. He yes, was yes. I find him so interesting. Again, as I'm getting older, I'm looking at him a little bit differently now. So when I was younger, I always looked at him as so villainous, so evil, you yeah. know? And, and now yeah. I'm just like, man, 
he conquers an entire continent in 50 years. And I'm not saying these are admirable qualities, but it's a compelling person. Oh, you know, like you want to know about the motivations behind something like this. It's slightly admirable. I mean, anybody that can. <laughs> well, but think about how he got there, right? He enslaved the entire continent, right? So obviously these are things that we don't agree with. It's just a matter right. of trying to get in the head of somebody that's like this. Like, how do they think? Yeah. Understanding that. He's a great villain. And you know, the funny thing is, he ain't even the villain. <laughs> That's what's great about him. That's crazy. Yeah. The sister elder said, we cannot allow this. Kalor interrupted. It has already happened, you <laughs> foolish woman. Cruel spoke within the minds of his kin. It must be done. I will fashion a, a place for this within myself. Draconis was horrified. He said, a warrant to hold all this? My brother. Cruel interrupted, no, it must be done. Join with me now. This shaping will not be easy. The sister elder said, it will break you, Cruel. There must be another way. Cruel said, none. To leave this continent as it is? No, this world is young to carry such a scar. Draconis asked, what of Kalor? What of this, this creature? Cruel said, we mark him. We know his deepest desire, do we not? Draconis asked, and the span of his life? Cruel said, long, my friends. Draconis said, agreed. Cruel blinked, fixed his dark, heavy eyes on Kalor. He said, for this crime, Kalor, we deliver appropriate punishment. Know this, you, Kalor Eideron Testhesula, shall know mortal life unending, mortal in the ravages of age, in the pain of wounds, and the anguish of despair, in dreams brought to ruin, in love withered, in the shadow of death's specter, ever a threat to end what you will not relinquish. Draconis spoke. Kalor Eideron Testhesula, you shall never ascend. Their sister said, Kalor Eideron Testhesula, each time you rise, you shall then fall. All that you achieve shall turn to dust in your hands. As you have willfully done here, so it shall be in turn visited upon all that you do. Cruel intoned, three voices curse you. It is done. I feel like some spitting needs to happen here. Oh, yeah. Lots of spitting. <laughs> Kalor trembled. His lips drew back in a rictus snarl. He said, I shall break you, each of you. I swear this upon the bones of seven million sacrifices. Cruel, you shall fade from this world. You shall be forgotten. Draconis, what you create shall be turned upon you. And as for you, woman, unhuman hands shall tear your body into pieces upon a field of battle. Yet you shall know no respite. Thus my curse upon you, sister of cold nights. Kalor Eideron Testhesula, one voice has spoken three curses. Thus. There are some really important details here. We'll discuss this in the next section, but it'd be good to commit some of that to memory. Yes. A real quick thing here for me that's kind of I just now thought of is the Imperial, uh, the, the warren that is created by Cruel. I'm assuming there's warrens that have no power in and of themselves. You know what I'm saying? It's like so many times we see warrens used as a place of harnessing them for something. Do you think there's any power in this warren that's created or is it just a tomb? I think it's a tomb because there's no life force in here. It's there's not based not. on any element. You know, it's no. an encapsulation. The warrens are in Cruel's veins. So for him to yes. take this, it's almost like having a mass of deadness inside of you. Yeah, I guess so. Wow. If this is a multiverse situation, which I'm of the opinion that it is, Azath from the Deadhouse Gates and all that other stuff kind of lean this direction. So is all of this, all of that inside also of Cruel? The Azath, I do not know. Yeah, because do they function within that? I feel like the Azath is older, like it's outside of Cruel. Cruel is like yeah. the modern Warrens, you know, the holds are older. Yeah. More primal versions of them. I have to read Deadhouse. It's like the Azath are doing something. <laughs> are the Azath like brain cells in a giant consciousness that is over the entire multiverse? It almost seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. In some strange way. Yeah. That's kind of how I think about it. Is it I'm glad to know. Do you think about it like that in a weird when way? When you mentioned it, I think you've said that before. And Have I? Okay. It sounds right to me where it's yeah. almost like, if not a nervous system or a, a brain type scenario maybe it's yes. more of something that fights infections the immune way. system for the warrens almost they are, yeah they are they're the, the reality immune system oh because oh, there a, you go because I, 
Yeah, because they protect all of reality, I think, when they try and take down powerful things. Yeah. Very nice. I think there we go. I think that's a very well pl- – it, why it's somewhat aware, only an aware that it needs to just – keep things together <laughs> keep it together keep it together. yes it has the instincts to hold everything together yeah very cool they left Kalor upon his throne upon its heap of bones they merged their power to draw chains around a continent of slaughter then pulled it into a warren created for that sole purpose leaving the land itself bared to heal and thus the imperial warren was created and I wonder how the Empire found it. Are you assuming it was Kelenvad and no one else that found it? I don't know because the Claw are using it, and I don't think he had much to do with them. This is true, but the Claw would have technically come up underneath him. Yeah, but in terms of finding it, you asked if he found it. I don't know. Because he's the kind of guy that I could see, because we we know that he, he obviously had to be a pretty powerful magic user of some sort. To have assembled this crew of dude he's like he put together the ultimate team for a heist i'm sorry that's what he's got that's his that's his old guard you know they're all just so awesome he's the george clooney character from oceans 11. Yeah, he is and then Danny he dancers the brad pitt character rusty yeah yes <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that's exactly where i'm going with this is that you know he found this a long time ago he's like you know what i'm gonna let the claw use it I'm going to, because that'd be a perfect way to, we're going to do this. We can travel by this and I can take out anyone I want anytime, anywhere. Because they work for him, technically, didn't they? Because <laughs> they work for Lucene slash Surly. I just don't know when they found it is what I'm saying. I don't know who found it or when they found it. But do you think it's around that time? Let's just put it like that. Like around Kellen Vlad's time? Or do you think it may go predate them? Because it could predate them. You know, we could be aware of this for hundreds of years. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Is the Malazan Empire founded by Kellenbed? I guess is the big, best my best question. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there was just like there's a group of just kind of like just whatever city states or whatever hanging out in Kellenbed just took power and rose to the top and I'm assuming took out Mock and then rose to the top and then united the continent under him. I don't remember how Mock played into it, but they definitely took that stronghold from him on Malaz Island because yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of where they started the Malazan Empire. Yeah. The effort left Cruel broken, bearing wounds he knew he would carry for all his existence. More, he could already feel the twilight of his warship, the blight of Kalor's curse. To his surprise, the loss pained him less than he would have imagined. The three stood at the portal of the lifeless realm and looked long upon their handiwork. Then Draconis spoke. Since the time of all darkness, I have been forging a sword. Both Cruel and the Sister of Cold Knights turned at this, for they had known nothing of it. Draconis continued, The forging has taken a long time, but I am now nearing completion. The power invested within the sword possesses a... a finality. After a moment, Cruel whispered, Then you must make alterations in the final shaping. Draconis said, So it seems. I shall need to think long on this. In case it wasn't clear... He's creating Dragnapur, and Draconis has never been mentioned prior to this book, so this is new information to us that it was created by him. And Kalor has just cursed him that his creation will be used on him. You know, I'm impressed that Kalor's curse actually bore fruit after they had stripped him of something. I mean, we stripped him of something essential, but they also bestowed something on him essential, which it sounds more like a curse of immortality, not just a gift of immortality to Kalor. Yeah, life will be ashes in your mouth, basically. Yeah, forever. And you'll be immortal, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After a long moment, Cruel and his brother turned to their sister. She shrugged and said, I shall endeavor to guard myself. When my destruction comes, it will be through betrayal and not else. There can be no precaution against such a thing, lest my life become its own nightmare of suspicion and mistrust. To this, I shall not surrender. Until that moment, I shall continue to play the mortal game. Cruel murmured, careful then, whom you choose to fight for. Draconis said, find a companion, a worthy one. Wise words from you both. I thank you. And this is Nightchill, and the companion she found was Bellardan. And we know from Gardens of the Moon that she does die to betrayal, as Tatrin summoned the demon that killed her during the Battle of Pale. And I forget that Nightchill is actually an elder god. Now, do you think Bellardan can't have been... The first pick. I don't think anything was hinted at Bellard being that old, was it? We don't know, because he's a Thelemon giant and has that Toblakai blood. Part of the giant races, yeah. And we don't really have an answer on how long they live. I'm assuming they're long-lived, but I don't, you know, I never assumed that they were, you know, immortal. And 
this is still like a hundred plus thousand years before Burns. One hundred and nineteen thousand. Okay, cool. So I don't think Bellardin is necessarily that old. I'm, I'm assuming she's had other people. Most importantly, I just forgot that she was uh, an elder god. <laughs> there was nothing more to be said. The three had come together with an intent they had now achieved. Perhaps not in the manner they would have wished, but it was done. And the price had been paid, willingly. Three lives in one, each destroyed. For the one, the beginning of eternal hatred. For the three, a fair exchange. Elder gods, it has been said, embodied a host of unpleasantries. I like that he closes this section out with this. I do too. <laughs> Just a great section, man. Oh, Calor. What an animal. Yeah, what an animal, dude. Just all of this knowledge, just kind of like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, <laughs> here's a lot of knowledge for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. In the distance, the beast watched the three figures part ways. Riven with pain, white fur stained in dripping blood, the gouged pit of its lost eye glittering wet, it held its hulking mass on trembling legs. It longed for death, but death would not come. It longed for vengeance, but those who had wounded it were dead. There but remained the man seated on the throne, who had laid waste to the beast's home. Time enough would come for the settling of that score. A final longing filled the creature's ravaged soul. Somewhere amidst the conflagration of the fall and the chaos that followed, it had lost its mate and was now alone. Perhaps she still lived. Perhaps she wandered, wounded as he was, searching the broken waste for sign of him. Or perhaps she had fled, in pain and terror, to the warren that had given fire to her spirit. Wherever she had gone, assuming she still lived, he would find her. The three distant figures unveiled their warrens, each vanishing into their elder realms. The beast elected to follow none of them. They were young entities as far as he and his mate were concerned. And the warren she might have fled to was, in comparison to those of the elder gods, ancient. The path that awaited him was perilous, and he knew fear in his laboring heart. The portal that opened before him revealed a gray-streaked, swirling storm of power. The beast hesitated, then strode into it, and was gone. And I find it interesting that he's considered ancient compared to even the Elder Gods, yeah. which is pretty crazy. It's almost like some type of primal force. Yes, very interesting. I get kind of confused like you because it's also misleading again. First Empire is not First Empire. Elder is not quite Elder. Right. So it's confusing, but I man, it's such great stuff though. And thus the prologue ends. Wow. For standout moments. The setup of the children replacing an unknown entity in the rent and the release of some unknown threat in the Kachain Shamal burial mound. I like that. Da, da, da. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely brutal, man. And it's like, wow. Okay. And it does not paint a certain bone caster in very good light. You're correct. <laughs> yeah. From a morals perspective, yeah, it's like, a, mm. well, but this, this book never claims moral superiority from anyone. There are people that appear more... Calor seems the outright, you know, real jerk out of the bunch. But, you know, there's some people that are pretty mean, but not as sadistic as Calor, but interesting bunch here. Yeah. The introduction of the god who was lured into this realm and ripped apart all to destroy Calor. Yeah. Wow. Dude. And failed. And, and failed. <laughs> Took out some of the competition for him, though. Made things a little wee bit easier for him to kill yeah. 7 million plus folks. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Kalor sitting on a throne that sits atop of heap of charred bones. What an introduction. I'm so sorry. I just had another black adder moment. <laughs> He's giving the king a, a, a cigarette case. He says, yes, it's our company logo, sir. It's a man sitting on top of a mount and a dead Frenchman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why that jumps up there, but it's like it's a throne on top of a bunch of dead Frenchmen or something like that. It's like, okay, oh, here, boy. Here, 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 here's this image here. And for some reason, it makes me laugh and it shouldn't. It's horrifying. Yeah. Calor defined the elder gods by exercising the nuclear option. Wow. It's like he doesn't even hesitate to pull that one. It's like, you know what? Go just do it. <laughs> just. He's so committed to winning. Yeah. He, just, he will destroy the game to win. He'll, he'll destroy the game and build another one, apparently. Is his plan to, but now he's cursed to. Yeah. I like that. Calor is cursed detailing why things that happened to Cruel, Draconis, and Nightchill. I appreciated the backstory there, oh, absolutely. where these are things that we've learned about over time. Well, I guess the Draconis thing, we learned about yeah. it here, but Cruel, we knew he faded into obscurity, and then Nightchill, we saw her die in <sighs> Gardens of the Moon. Yeah. And unaware of her status, of who she really was. Such a right. big, big time player. 
and I did like the tying of that thread yes, of Night Jill, dude. finding out who she was and closing that up. Yeah, great stuff. Very nice. Nicely done. And then finding out the origins of the Imperial Warren. Yes. I'm always fascinated by that Warren for some reason. And, I, and it answers a lot of questions, but it doesn't answer the questions of what lives there. <laughs> Yeah, so it must be some stuff that moved in. Yeah, that's not good. And then finally, learning that Draconis created Dragnapur. That's a big piece of information there. They think about the other big part of that information is he's been forging it since the time of the All Dark. So for what, All Dark plus a couple hundred thousand years I've been working on it, still ain't got it together yet? We don't have something to link Burn Sleep to that timeline yet, so I don't know how long he's been working on it. I know. But it. he's been working on it for a while. Before Light. Yeah. I mean, Dave, apparently, I'm, I'm assuming that's what that means. So that's, I found that very interesting. So, but yeah, the, especially that he's the creator of Dragapur. That's a nasty thing. <laughs> nasty. Yeah. All right, Billy. Great job tonight. Hey, great episode, man. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Great intro to a great new book, man. I love the super ancient flashbacks dealing with the elders and Calor. Just such crazy stuff, man. And what a great show tonight, dude. Yeah. Great show. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.